Yeah. Good morning, Rabbi Rabotai. We're continuing on Sechet Brachot, and we have just completed the first Mishnah of the ninth Perek, Perek Haro'e, on Daf Nindalit, Amud Aleph. The learning of Amud Yomi for Kodesh Tevet has been sponsored by Shab and Shana Zarabi for health, happiness, and prosperity of their family, the Aliyah Torah and Achatim children, and has been sponsored anonymously for Fashel Ma'av Rachel Bat Miriam that should have a complete Rufashel Ma'amin. We studied the Mishnah. This is one of those difficult things that every line literally has um, so much to be spoken about, and that's not just there for yesterday. A lot of this parak is going to be in that way, but nevertheless, we started the parak with Haroem Makom Shna Asubo Nisim Le Israel Omer Baruch Shasa Nisim Lavotenu Ba Makom Azeh. If you come across a place that miracles have happened to the Jewish nation, you make a bracha. How do you know that? Look, you remember when we in sixth parak we said you say bracha. The Mara said, "How do you know that? How do you know that you have to say bracha? Where do you get that concept from?" Same, same pattern over here. The Gemara says, how do you know that you have to make what we call Birkat Hoda? A bracha sometimes is a Birkat Hanenin, that you benefit from something and you make a bracha. And that has to be, of course, prior to it. And then you have sometimes that you make Birkat Shevach and Birkat Hoda. You're thanking Hashem for something. This is part of Birkat Hoda. And Mara says, how do you know that there is such a concept that when you encounter a nest that happened, you thank Hashem? Says the Gemara, how do we know this? Because the Pasuk says about Yitro, the upcoming stories in the, in, in the Chumash, this is when um, Moshe Rabbeinu and Yitro meet after they come out of Mitzrayim, after the encounter. Again, this is um, questionable exactly when this was. Was it uh, before or after Matan Torah? But certainly it was after <coughs> the 10 plagues and coming out of Mitzrayim with the opening of the sea and Kriyat Yamsuf. So the, the Pasuk says, when Moshe Rabbeinu finishes saying all the things that happened, Yitro thanks Hashem. He says, Baruch Hashem asher yitzil etchem miyad Mitzrayim miyad paro asher yitzil et ha'am mitachad yad Mitzrayim. He gives a praise to Hashem for all the nisim that Hashem has done for Am Yisrael. So you see, you see there is a source for thanking Hashem for a nest when you encounter a nest that happened. So says the Gemara, wait a second. We mentioned this in the Mishnah, that the Mishnah seems to say, When you encounter a place that Nisim happened for Jews. And now the example we gave also was something that encompassed the entire Am Israel went through the Mavar Hayam, through the opening of the sea. So is it limited only to a communal nest that happened to everyone? Gemara says that's what it sounds like from the language of the Mishnah. And the Gemara has a problem with that. Says the Gemara, you don't say bracha on an individual's nest, individual miracle that happened to one person. gavra, don't we know that there's a story? This fellow, the Avakazi, every Amina, he was going this place every Amina, nafalare. Arya, and he was attacked by a lion. It's Abit Lenisa Veitzil. Normally speaking, if a lion attacks you, you know, Shema Israel, and this guy had miraculously survived the attack. He comes in front of Rava and says, You won't believe what happened. I had this African lion attack me, and you know, he dropped dead. Says the Gemara, Amalek, Kolemat de Matid Latam. Rava told him, every time that you pass by that place that this happened, Berich, 
you should say a bracha baruch shasali nes b'makom hazeh. Instead of the language of the Mishnah of nisim l'avotenu, say baruch shasali nes b'makom hazeh. Right? So you see from here, Rava Paskin, that one single individual would make a bracha if he encountered a single individual nest. Doesn't have to be a massive, groundbreaking communal nest. It could be your nest, and you say bracha on it. Marbreda Ravina, the son of Ravina, Havakasil be pitka de Aravot. He was going in a valley in a place called Aravot. That's a place that's very. It, it, Dry, the water, he was dehydrated, he was endangered, he needed water. Sachalemaya, very thirsty. It abit lenisa, ivri le enademaya, and miraculously, <coughs> spring of water appeared right in front of him, and he drank, he was good. Miracle. Something that was not normally there. It wasn't a, a known spring of water or a river, not, nothing of that nature existed there. And all of a sudden he had water in front of him exactly when he needed it. The Ishti and he drank the two and he had another encounter of, of a miracle uh, type of story. He was walking in the marketplace of the city of Mechuza. And there was this wild camel that had gone out of control and started it literally charging towards him, attacking him. And that usually means, uh, you know, your family could, uh, uh, could, could order the, the stone, right? And right before the, the, the wild camel got to him, Miraculously, the wall of the house right next to him fell just enough that he could slide inside the house and be saved from this, this uh, camel. Miracle. He was saved. So says the Gemara, he would say bracha every time he would encounter any of these two places. And the Gemara says, every time that he got to any of these places, he would thank for both of the miracles that saved his life. When he would get to this place of Aravot, the first place that he found the water, he would say, Baruch Shasali Nes Baravot Ubagamal. He would thank Hashem for what happened in Aravot. And also, it's like Gilgul Shivua. Once he had the bracha already, he would also remember the nest that happened to him elsewhere, which was not there. Rabbi, why is this bracha more specific than the brush before? Very good question. And not only that, you see that, that he one of them is the place and the other one is the topic. It doesn't say right? It doesn't say right? For, for the water, it says the place and for the um, for, for the Gamal, he says the Gamal, and still saying the place that was in the, in the marketplace of Mechuza. Now, your question is easier to answer because here is not just saying Bamakomaze. He is actually thanking Hashem for two things. So he has to be specific, right? When you are making one Hoda'a for one nest that happened in this place, you just could say, you don't have to say what nest it was. You know what nest it was that happened in this place. You just say, Baruch Hashem, that he did nest for me in this place. You don't have to specify. But if you're specifying more than one, then you have to specify more. Right? But still needs a little birur. Uh, why exactly the change between the name and the place? So says the Gemara, Kimata Leristika de Mechuzah, when he got to the marketplace in the city of Mechuzah, he would say the Brachat the reverse order. In other words, every time where he was is the main Brachat that he's making. So that would be mentioned first. And the other one would be like a, a tag along addition. Once you're saying the Hoda, once you're allowed to say the Bracha, you may as well thank Hashem for saving your life elsewhere as well. So therefore he would say, Baruch Shasali Nes Begamal Uba'arabot. He would thank for the, the, the miracle that happened with, with the wild camel because he's now in the marketplace in the Chuzah where this happened. And he would tag, it, tag also the um, Nes of 
Aravot, the far, that he found water and his life was saved, also to it. So this concludes the, there's a long sentence question. In other words, the Gemara started 10 lines ago. Wait a second, you only make a bracha on a communal nest. How about a private nest that I had or one single individual had? And don't tell me no, because I have all these stories that they were told to say a bracha. So you see, it's not just the communal nest that you say bracha on. You say it on your private nest also, says the Gemara. But it's also includes family members. Well, we, we haven't discussed that. And that's the Gemara's um, answer, basically. Amri, they answered, Anisa de Rabim Kula Alma Mechaibile Baruchi. When a communal nest happens, 50 generations later, you're passing by and say, Oh, the Jews passed here. My ancestors passed by here. And the nest happened to them. You are Chayav to say Bracha for a nest that happened to somebody else. But for a Yahid, Anisa de Yahid, a private miracle that happened. Only he is chayav to say the bracha. Others um, don't necessarily have to say the bracha, right? Now, there are others. The, the Hagaot Gra over here says, Ubereh ubarbere, and his son and his grandson. So direct descent may be like that. That's considered part of you because without you, they will not be there, right? <laughs> But your sister or your first cousin three times removed would not say bracha because your life is saved. But by a communalness, then everybody says a bracha. Says the Gemara. Tanu Rabbanan. Haro'em, mavrota yam, mavrota yarden. If you encounter the place that Jews stood by, Yamsuf and the, the Yamsuf opened, or if you stand by the place in the Jordan River where the Jews passed the Jordan, and we have a similar miracle that happened there as well, it was a little bit different. Whereas in Yamsuf, the water basically dried, and according to the Tosafot, many other Rishonim was tunnels in the water, and maybe 12 of them. But by Mavrota um, Yarden, the Kohanim with the Aaron stepped into the water. And as they stepped in the water, the Pasuk says the water stopped, come, stopped passing. It just piled up instead of passing through. And the rest of the water went. And therefore, from here and on, it was dry land, basically. The water was just stopped like a dam until the Jews passed. And the Kohanim waded inside the river with the Aaron, with the Ark of the Covenant, until everybody passed, and then they passed through, which becomes a look at what exactly happened then with the Kohanim. Did they also pass, or did they go back, and the water started coming, and then they miraculously went over the water? That's a separate question. Says the Gemara. So if you encounter that exact place in Jordan River that the miracle happened, or that exact place in the uh, Reed Sea that the sea opened, then you make the bracha of Shasan Nesla Botenu, and so on. Says the Gemara. But that's not the only two. Those two are famous, as the Gemara is going to bring their psukim, but there's also Nachale Arnon, the, the rivers of Arnon, Avne El Gabish, the stones of El Gabish. If you see one of those stones, you say bracha. Bemorat bet choron, the event should be cash. Lizrok og melech abashan al Israel. If you see this, the, the, the rock, the mountain, the piece of, of mountain that, that og melech abashan wanted to throw at the Jewish nation, if you see that, you say, Bracha, the event she ashab alea Moshe Besha Shasa Yoshua Milchamach, the rock that Moshe Rabbeinu sat on on top of the mountain when the first ever battle with the with the from the Jews with Umota Olam with Amalek happened and Moshe Rabbeinu was holding his hands up and at some point he started sitting on a rock and Yeshua and Caleb they were holding his hands 
Apparently they had like a museum with explanation of uh, all of these things. They, they, they knew where these are. Otherwise, they, the Chazal would not say it if nobody knew. But if, if you knew, so then when you see this is the rock that Moshe Rabbeinu was sitting on in the first ever Milchama with Amalek, then you say bracha, because that's where the nest happened. Or the Ishtom Shel Lot. If you see the wife of Lot, now the wife of Lot, when they were running away from the Hafichat Sdoma Murad Maus Foim, when those four cities were destroyed and they were running for their life, the Malach told them, Alta do, do not look back. And she did, the wife of Lot, Mrs. Lot looked back, but the he Nitziv Melach. And she turned into a pillar of salt. Now, if you see this pillar of salt, you make a bracha, which the obvious question is, what miracle is that exactly? Now, it is miraculous for a person to turn into salt, right? You would maybe want some people to turn into a pillar of salt, but, but you know, what kind of miracle it is that you're saying, Baruch Shasan Nes? That what, what, what exactly is the bracha that you're making? First of all, that's not Avotenu. Lot is, maybe Lot later on became the father of Ammon and Moab. That has nothing to do with Mrs. Lot, right, necessarily. And what kind of nest is a Pura'anut? Someone dying in that tragic way? Like what kind of, That's something that the, the Gemara is going to discuss. And if you see the wall, the, the wall around Jericho, the city of Yericho, also make a bracha. Now, what was the story there? The, um, the first part of the conquest of Eretz Yisrael was the city of Yericho. When the Jews came and, and Jericho was perhaps the most fortified city that you could have in Eretz Yisrael, it was built on top of a um, a hilltop, and the wall of this hilltop led to another wall, which was the built wall of, of Jericho around the city, and it was as wide as it was tall. So people actually lived inside the wall. It was a massive, there was no way to destroy it. Imagine a wall that's as, as thick as this room. What, what are you going to destroy exactly? You can't um, and, and says the, the, the Pasuk that they had a whole process. The entire thing was miraculous. They went with the Kohanim, with Shofarot, and they went around the city blowing Shofar once every day for seven days. The seventh day, they, they, they did it seven times. Hence the Hakafot that we have, exactly that, that pattern. And the, the fall just dropped. And then they, they went up and they, they conquered the city. They set it on fire and that became a, um, you know, the, the, the beginning of many successes afterwards that when the rest of it was just domino effect that they went through the 31 kingdoms inside Eretz Canaan, Jericho, the Yericho was the first one. And that was a massive miracle, basically. So if you see Chomat Yericho, which the nest happened to it, you make a bracha. Says the Gemara. Al Kulan Sadiq Shaitan Hodan, all these, you must give hoda'a and shevach to HaKadosh Baruch Hu lifnei hamakom to Hashem. Amen. So says the Gemara, Bishlama Mavrot Hayam, says, I understand the place that the Reed Sea opened and they went in, fine, I get it. Ve'avod, the Pasuk says clearly, that is a miracle. If that's not a miracle, what's a miracle? They went into the sea that the sea was dry land. Inside the sea, they passed through. So that's pretty clear. The passage of the Jordan River also is pretty clear in the Pasuk because it says, as I explained before, the Kohanim who were carrying the Aaron, Aaron Aprit, they went in dry land inside the Jordan River. So that seems like a pretty clear demonstration of a nest that they are standing on dry land 
inside the Jordan River, and then the entire nation passes through dry land. So, of course, that is pretty clear that the, the, the Jordan River opened. Now, as we explained, it was a little bit different the way it happened than, than the Yamsuf, but nevertheless, it's pretty clear the, the explanation of the nest in the Pasuf. Says the Gemara, and it says, the Holy Israel of Rimba Harava, Adashetamu Kola Goy, Lavor et Ayarden. The entire Jewish nation passed through dry land, through the Jordan River, through Yarden, until every single last one passed. So that's pretty clear. Elam Avrod Nachale Arnon Minalan. How do you know this? What is this story of Nachale Arnon? We don't seem to know about this exactly. So what is it? Says the Gemara, I'll explain to you. It says in Bamidbar Perekhaf Aleph, Al Ken Yamer Besefer Milchamot Hashem. Therefore, it will be said in the in the book of Milchamot Hashem, the battles that Hashem fought for Klal Yisrael. Et vahev besufa veet anechalim arnon. So, what does that mean? Et vahev besufa. Tana, we learned the explanation of this. Et vahev, the two people, that's their name. Et, and the other one is Hev, Besufa. They were at the end of encampment of the Jewish nation. The Sofa Machane. Why were they coming at the end outside the Machane, passing after the entire nation passed? Because, says the Gemara, they were Shnei Mesoraim Habu. There were two uh, lepers that we you know, incorrectly or not, not in an exact way, translate Mesorah as leprosy. It's not really rep- leprosy, but that's, you know, whatever sickness it was, spiritual. Machala, um, these people were Mesoraim. Now, how do you have a Mesorah? By Har Sinai, everyone, all the Mesoraim were, were healed. So either you have to say after Cheta Egel, it came back, or you have to say that they were healed even eternally, but afterwards, if you said Lashon Hara, then you became a Masorah again, just like it happened to Miriam, right? So, be as it may, they were Masorah. Masorah is considered a high level of Tum'ah, like a Zav, and it has to go out of all the three encampments, encampment levels of Am Yisrael. Different people with different levels of Tum'ah are allowed in different places. Now, Mesora is completely out of all the Machan. In other words, it has to be not just out of Machane Shechina, not just out of Machane Levia, but also out of Machane Israel, the larger encampment, the general Jewish camp. They have to be completely out of the Machane, right? Badad Yeshev, Chutz Machane Moshavo, right? So, therefore, these two people were coming after the nation already had passed. And therefore, they got to encounter something that nobody else saw. What was it? Are they considered trustworthy uh, Masoras? Like, like, generally speaking, like maybe- generally speaking, has nothing to do with your trustworthiness. But in this case, happens to be that you don't need to trust them because they, they checked it. Okay. Says the Gemara. What happened exactly? They have a last line. The Sof Machane Israel. They were going after the entire encampment. Ki habu Israel. Now, what happened was before the Jews passed through these mountains, there were, there were mountains that they were expecting the Jews to pass through in between them. And they hid, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, they hid inside the holes of these mountains on a higher level, and they were ready there with stones to throw at them with bows and arrows, they wanted to kill the Jews. And of course, they, the best advantage is when you know that they're going to go through in between two mountains and you're, you know, situated high above on both of the mountains from two sides and you have what it takes to throw at them, you're good to go. That's a kind of non, no-brainer, basically. And that's exactly what this Amoraim did. This Amorites came and Abdullah and Kuruta Vetashu, they situated themselves in the holes in this mountains on the two sides. And they hid there, the waiting for the Jews to pass. Amri, they said the plan was, Israel, when they pass through here, 
Not the Linun, we will kill them. They were missing a, a crucial part of, of the thing, a piece of information. They didn't know that Aaron have a mask Israel, that the Aaron would go in front of the travels of Am Israel. They had the Anan also going with there, and it will flatten any obstacle on the way, including mountains. So what will happen is instead of them going through this difficult passage, right, everything would be, you know, put together and flattened out, and then it would go back to norm after Machane Israel would pass. So they basically dug their graves by hiding in there because when, before the Jews came, these mountains came squishing together basically <laughs> and flattening the Jews passed. And then when this opened afterwards, at, at Vahev, these two people saw rivers of blood going into Nachale Arnon, into the rivers of Arnon. And they traced it back to blood pouring out of these two sides of the mountain. And there was no war. They just passed there. Everything was quiet and nice. And you have fresh blood coming out of everywhere. So they went and told the Jews. They checked. They realized what had happened. So they said Shira. This was like a quietness that happened. And only in retrospect, they, they found out what had happened because of Et Vahed, says the Gemara. That's, that's the miracle that we are speaking of. And we're going to read it just through the Gemara. But Abu Yadi, the Amorites did not know that Aaron would pass in front of the nation. The Hava Memich Dehu Turi would flatten out the hilltops and mountains. Every obstacle in the way would be flattened and paved, basically. Mikamayu, that's one of the big miracles that happened through the passage of the Midbar. Kevan the Ata, it would also take away the scorpions and snakes and all the dangers. Everything would be you know, completely made easy for them in their passage through the Midbar. That's one of the miracles that happened throughout the 40 years in the Midbar. So says the Gemara, Kevan the Ata Aaron, Ad Bekuturi Be'ade Adadi. Once the Aaron came, these two mountains that they were planning their attack from attached to, each, to one another, they, they came together. The Katlinun, and they killed all these Amorites that were, were plotting against the Am Yisrael. And their blood went, was going into the rivers of Arnon. After this whole passage happened, when Etvahev are following the Machane from outside, they saw the two mountains now opened from each other once again. And they saw the blood is coming from in between the two mountains. They said they came and they told the Jews, they said, Shira. And that's what it says. The Eshet means Shafach, it means pouring out of, of the Nechalim. This is adjacent to the, the borders of Moab by the Amorites. So says the Gemara. I guess they were the only Mesoraim. Nobody else said Lashon Hara. Good people. Says the Gemara, Avne al Gabish. What is the story of Avne al Gabish? What does it mean even Avne al Gabish? Says the Gemara, my Avne al Gabish. What does it mean Avne al Gabish? Tana, we learned Avanim Shamdu al Gabish. This is like Notarikun. Al Gabish is al Gabish. Stones that stayed stationary above an ish, above a man. So what does that mean exactly? They stayed stationary above a man, yardu al gav ish, and they came down later on from above another man. So what does that exactly mean? Amdu al gav ish, ze Moshe. That they stayed stationary above a man. That's that man is Moshe. Dichtiv. We see in the pasuk Moshe Rabbeinu is called an ish. Ish Moshe Anav Meod. His nickname is Ish. So when when he says Ish, is a reference to Moshe. Uchtiv. Ve'achtenu akolot va'abarat u'matar lo nitach arsa. This is very interesting language in the pasuk when you talk about barat. 
which was a deadly makkah. And it was miraculous. These were like rocks basically coming with ice and fire inside. It was like, uh, you know, the, the massive landmines pouring from the, 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 the heaven on top of Mitzrayim. Uh, they burned everything, broke everything, destroyed and set everything on fire. This was, you know, when, when Paro could not, no, could no longer tolerate. And this is the, the warning of Makat Barat is very unique in, in a way that you don't see in any of other plagues of Mitzrayim. But the, when, when Moshe Rabbeinu davens for it to stop, the language of Pasuk is very interesting. I'm not sure if you have ever paid attention, but the Pasuk says, the, the massive thunderous voices, noise that was, was there, stopped. And the barad did not reach the ground. Which means what? It doesn't say they stopped, which would have been the regular verbiage to be used, just like other ones. It says they didn't hit the ground. That means Moshe Rabbeinu Davin, there are all these millions of barat still in the space, and they just never completely fell down. They stopped coming down from where they were. So where did they, they're, they're hovering suffer in the, in, the, in, the, in the upper heaven. So what happened with them? They didn't reach down until later on in, in history when Yeshua needed, when they were trying to, to fight with the Amorites to, to take over Gibbon. Yardu al Ish, they came down later on, on another Ish, for another Ish. That is Yoshua because Yoshua also is called an Ish. In the Pasuk, Kach Lecha et Yoshua ben Binun Ish Asher Ruach Bo. Uchtiv, and how do we know that this happened? In the process of their battle with the Amorites in the Milchama of Givon, it says, When they started, uh, so at some point in the battle, they started running away from, from uh, the Israeli uh, army, basically, from Bnei Israel. And they were in this place of Morad Ben Choron, Hashem Yishlich Alehem Abanim Gedolot. Hashem through at them abanim gedolot. So you have this nest that is mentioned in the Pasuk in Sefer Yoshua. It's clearly mentioned. You don't need a Midrash for that. It's mentioned in the Pasuk that they were attacked directly mina shavayim by Hashem by abanim gedolot. <clears throat> the Gemara makes the connection between this nest that's mentioned in Sefer Yoshua and the Pasuk that we just mentioned in Makat Barat, which seems to clearly indicate that they were hovering, they, were, they stopped from coming down, but they were there, says this is that. That's what happened, and that's why it's called Avnel Gavish, in other words. Avnel Gavish is the stones that came down in the time of Yeshua. We know that. If you see one of those, you make a bracha. Now, the Gemara gives you some backdrop of history of why they're called Al Gavish because of this thing of Al Gavish, Al Gavish. Al-Gavish stands for Notarikun of Al-Gavish, which comes to tell you the very name is telling you this connection, this Agadic connection between the time of Moshe Rabbeinu and the time of Yushua. But nevertheless, even put the Agadah aside, it's a nest that's mentioned in the Pesukim, in Sefer Yushua, by the Milchama of, of, of Givon. So says the Gemara. Well, if you find one of them, please let us all know. But I, I'm, I'm not sure if we have kept any of this. Uh, well, all jokes aside, now when you go to the excavations in Eretz Israel, they actually have the, the stones that were thrown at Beit HaMikdash in Bayit Sheni in the process of destroying Bayit Sheni. They have them. And they show them to you how, where they were thrown from and where they landed. And you have a whole lot of them there. And the destruction that they caused, even though that's been 2,000 years now, but still they're there. So, and that's after cities being built on top of it and, and so on and so forth. Or, for that matter, 
we're going to discuss this a little bit more, but uh, several years ago, one of the, the Rabbanim, he, he, him and another non, non, uh, non-Jewish producer, they put together something which is very Kedai to see called Patterns of Evidence. And part of that one little clip of it was they, they found in excavations the wall of Jericho that we talked we just talked about. You actually could see the pictures. It's pretty mind-boggling. You see how, how, how they, they, they found it out and the, the remnants of even the, the produce that was inside the earthwork clay, things that they had inside the house that was burnt. As the Pasuk says, they, they set the city on fire and it's clear the season of it based on how full they were. It's, it's pretty amazing how you could be thousands of years later, and this we're talking about already 3,400 years ago, and, and, and you could still have the clear evidence of uh, some, some uh, biblical events that, that happened back then, and now you could see the remnants of that putting the pieces together. So, of course, if you see that, that's the bracha that you would make. Now, if you find the, these things at some point, you make a bracha. So I'm not sure if, historically speaking, they had a mesorah of which one is what. But nevertheless, again, I'm not sure if they, in the time of the Gemara, they knew Jericho's thing because there were cities built on top of it afterwards. It is only now that we could kind of like know what, what's what exactly. But uh, nevertheless, if you do know it, you say bracha. Of course, if you don't, or if you're doubtful, it will be safek brachot. Lakel, as we mentioned before, says the Gemara, <coughs> And that is the story of Arne al Gabish. One more. The, the rock, the mountain piece that, that Og wanted to throw at, at the Jews. Gemara Gimiri, we have a Mesorah dating back generation after generation that said Og, Og was a giant, of course, he was the last of the giants, the only one that Moshe Rabbeinu even was afraid from him, to the degree that Hashem had to say, al do not be afraid of him, right? This is after 40 years of being, encountering Nisim back to back, of course, Chazal say he was afraid because of the Zchut and so on, but nevertheless, you see that the encounter was not a regular encounter, he was a giant. Now the Gemara goes to say some agotic pieces of information on how big this was, but you have to keep in mind that aside from Agada, Og is the only person that was so massive that the Pasuk in the Torah gives you a size for his crib when he was just born, right? Which is uh, larger than any person that you could encounter in um, this day and age as a grown man. So that's in the only place that the Torah actually makes a point of a size of a giant so says the Gemara, Amar Machane Israel Kama. How big is Machane Israel? Utlata Parsi Alta. The Parsi, he says, I will pick up a stone that's that big and throw it at them all at once. We'll be done with the Jews. A final solution one, once and forever. And he picked it up. What happened was, Azal Akatura, he did pick this up. Bartelata Parsi, the IT Adreshe, and he brought it up on his, his head to throw it. What happened was Kuchabrich Hashem made it that little ants, they, they, they made a hole inside this and he went actually through his head. He lost control of it. And when he wanted to pick it up, Ba'ile Mishlefa, he wanted to bring it out of his, his, his head. And Mashkishinen, miraculously, his teeth got stuck with this, you know, expanding, extending out downwards, stopping him from being able to take it out. And then, and he couldn't bring it back out, so now he, he's, he, he lost balance, and he can see also. And that's what the Pasuk says, you broke the teeth of Rashaim. And the Gemara says, don't say, Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish says, Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, what does it mean when it says, don't read Shibarta, Ela, Shirivavta or Shirvavta that you extended, you expanded their teeth, and that's a reference directly to this story of the nest with Oga Merachabashan. And therefore, if you see that 
rock, that mountain, that piece of stone, you make a bracha. And then the Gemara says, Moshe was 10 amot tall, and he took an ax, a, a, um, a, a weapon that was also 10 amot tall, and he jumped 10 amot, that's 30 amot, and he hit the ankle of, of, of Og Melechabashan, and that's how he killed him. So that's give, just to give you a, an idea of how, how, how much of a giant was Og, and says the Gemara, he hit him in his ankle, the Katle. And he killed him, but we will continue this in the days to come. Oh. <laughs> this is a great stuff.